Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold. Bible study hour. Well, we're going to finish up this first book of Peter today, The Rock. We'll do this fifth chapter, and then I want to recap just a little bit so that we capture the overall thought, the highlights of this first book of Peter. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed teaching it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father in the name of our Savior Jesus, Yeshua. And let's pick up chapter 5, 1 Peter, verse 1, and it reads, uh, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, actually witnessed it, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here we have this one, considering himself to be an elder, he wants to speak to the elders, one with responsibility. Don't forget in the last lecture, he says judgment begins with the house of God and right, from the, right at the pulpit first, the place of the elder. And he said, I was there, I witnessed the sufferings of Christ. I, I would think that you could imagine for a moment and I can't help doing this at times. This old fisherman, who no doubt had weathered many a storm, had been in precarious situations, I imagine, endless times, and was a man's man, so to speak, and had said to Christ before the suffering, I will not leave you. I will die with you. And Jesus looked at him and said, Oh, Peter, before the cock will crow, you will deny me thrice. And so it was. I have to say that I feel it happened, I feel it happened as a lesson to us, in a sense, that God caused it to happen in exactly in the way that it did whereby you yourself can feel the emotion, especially those of this generation, that generation in which the false Christ comes, that you must be prepared spiritually and mentally to know that you will not do as they did on that day of the suffering, but you as God's election will stand that's what the gospel armor um, prepares you for, is to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Now, there's not going to be any darts flying other than from his mouth, lies, and the Holy Spirit will be with you. But when Peter said this, I know that he said it in a way that probably his own conscience would pain him, though he knew he had been forgiven very difficult for a man's man to have denied Christ thrice as he did without having a deeper emotion about it, knowing full well through the love of God that he's totally forgiven. But at the same time, I saw it. I know when he spoke those words that it had to run deep. Verse 2, this is his instruction to the elder, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, be an overseer of what they do, or see over what they do, not by constraint, but willingly, not because you have to, but willingly participate, not for filthy lucre, not, not for money, don't be a hireling. Don't do it for the reason of being a hireling, but of a ready mind. Now, what was it that 
a teacher was supposed to teach. He told us in the last lecture, in verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11, he said, teach the scriptures of God, or the oracles of God, which is to say the scriptures. That's what you'll teach. Now, tell me this. Not grudgingly, enjoy what you do. Don't do it with constraint. To constrain oneself is what? Well, it's not only to do it grudgingly, it's to hold back. Many times people hold back, I feel, because they don't have a ready mind. How do you prepare yourself with a ready mind? You do your homework. If you're going to teach the oracles of God, then you had better thee well know them. You had better thee well know what you're talking about, the subject you're teaching. You better have done your homework. Why? Judgment starts here. Judgment starts here with the teacher. So you had better have had a ready mind. And that mind had better be clicking. It had better know what those oracles mean in whatever language you're teaching from or to. That the emotions, the very feelings that are displayed, that would come from the Father's mind, as he brings forth those scriptures. He says, don't hold back. Be willing and have your mind ready. Verse 3. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Don't lord it over people. But being in samples to the flock. In other words, Christ was our example. He was our shepherd. And the under-shepherd is a sheep is of that flock also. So be humble in that. Most of all, let people know that the scriptures come from God, not you. Don't set your people will. If, if a person has the gift of God and is, let's say they're a fantastic evangelist, and they would be a fantastic evangelist because God's gifted evangelist is a fantastic evangelist. But it is God's gift that makes the evangelist not the man. That's a hard lesson to learn. Because soon they begin to pay heed to the evangelist as a man, and he begins to get on an ego trip, and the next thing you know, he'll start lording it over people. That is not to say that you are not supposed to be firm and disciplined in handling your ministry. But there is a difference in being firm and disciplined and lording it over somebody, wanting people to worship you rather than the living God. Don't ever serve God for the sake of money. Now that is not to say that a pastor should not be paid or enumerated uh, for his time and effort because a, for, a, a laborer is worthy of his hire. But he had better be doing it primarily for the love of God, and that simply is a part of it. Uh, I personally chose to do it, it another way, and we won't go into that. But never, you know, to neither being lords over God's heritage. You know what God's heritage is? You know what your heritage is? Your heritage is to inherit the kingdom of God, and God's heritage is you. You're his children. He loves you very much. And God doesn't like it when somebody starts lording it over his children any more than you would like it if someone started lording things over your children. Quite frankly, you wouldn't put up with it. You know something? He won't either. Either. Either way you wish to say it. Okay, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, and he's going to, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. In other words, if you do it in this manner, you'll receive the goodness of God. Call it a crown if you want to. But the blessings of God. And did you get the word never? 
never fade away. It will always be there. Talk about fairness. Never whimper nor complain about God's Word or having to do God's Word for the simple reason that the time you spend doing that for the right reasons and this does not, I've, I've got to elders, elders are responsible for many things. You may be an elder of faith only. That's your gift and you receive a crown for it that will never fade. Your, your gift may be planting seeds, not one every five minutes, but it may only be one every month or two. But that's your gift. Do it, be ready for it, be prepared for it, know your subject, be able to answer questions that people can say, I would really like to be like that person. I would like to have their peace of mind. I would like to have their, they are so sure of themselves. How I would like to feel that sure of myself. That's simply what God's Word does for you. It lets you be sure of yourself. As sure as sure can be. Not a doubt. Knowing our Father is in control. He has His hand on us. And He looks over His children with this chief shepherd being our overseer or sees over what we do. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. If the elder uh, conforms to the rules laid forth in, in, in the chapter. All right? If, don't submit yourself to a lord it over you all. All right? Don't do it. You're not required to. But to one that fulfills as best he can, I, I suppose that it's, you know that um, an ego is something that's very easy for a person of prominence to adapt to themselves. But um, a little bit of it, well, I don't know. You know, maybe he couldn't help that. Still respect him if he's doing his work properly. Otherwise, as so stated in God's word, that you do, the example was set forth, and you'll be all right. Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Now, that's what's important subject one to another and be clothed with humility. In other words, you are all equally loved and are all equally important to our Father. I don't care what you do. Well, do you mean that here your teaching, your voice goes into a hundred million homes and I'm just a lay person out here supporting you and I only plant a seed once a month or so and I'm as important to God as you are? That's what I said. That's what the scripture says. Do you know why? It isn't. When you are teaching God's gift, it isn't the man that's speaking. If he fulfills these rules and regulations, it is not the man, nor should you even consider it to be the man. It is the gift of God that does it. It is God's gift in you that plants the seed. And as men, we are equal. If God gives someone a blessing and a gift and, and so forth, they cannot take credit for it. So you are to submit to each other. Not have one that lords it over the whole flock. Well, a minister is supposed to be uh, responsible for his flock. True. But the gift had better be from God that brings forth the discipline. It better not be a lord it over you discipline. Do you understand? That also comes from God. Look to him, not the man. It may be difficult to grasp the fullness and to the depth that I want you to take that thought. I'm not asking you not to respect. I'm asking you to give credit where the credit is due and that is to our Heavenly Father. And we submit, submit one to the other. And uh, okay, where, where were we here? Let's go, we're still right there. You submit, what, you submit one to another and be clothed with humility. Let's be humble before God, knowing it's real easy to be humble before God if you realize everything you have, He has given you. For God resisteth the proud, 
And how does he resist? He doesn't put forth blessings. He may even chunk a rock in the road for you. And giveth grace to the humble. What, what is grace? Favor. God favors the humble. God doesn't bless the proud. So, you want to be very careful what you think in your own mind about yourself. If people begin telling you how great you are, you want to be very careful because you live with yourself. You put your socks on. You, have, you change your underwear every day. Do you know what you're like? So be honest with yourself. I'm, I just put a little earthly touch to that so it gets you right down where the rubber meets the road and know that everything that is good about you was given by God and give him the credit. That's, that brings you under that terminology of humbleness. And, and a truly, at the same time, God favors humbleness. Well, I'm really going to take off today and I'm going to be so humble. I'm going to act humble before everyone. Hey, hey, anytime someone have, must show people how humble they are, you just ain't, honey. All right, you just ain't. You don't have to tell someone how humble you are. It's one of those natural traits that being mature in our Father's Word, absorbing the full significance of where all wisdom comes from and giving credit for that will, wisdom, leaves a human being in nothing but a state of thankfulness to Him. And that's a very humbling thought. Okay. God gives grace to the humble and he withholds it and obstructs the proud, those on an ego trip. If you ever see a ministry where especially the minister is on an ego trip, it is not a ministry that will last. It will fall because God brings the fiery test trial upon someone that gets out of line. And when God's fire rests upon one, it burns as far as hurt to get one back into that state as a child should be to its parent. That is to say, your relationship between yourself and our Heavenly Father. Verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That's the way it works, friend. It doesn't work any other way. If you want to really serve God, then memorize that verse. Remember that sixth verse. Memorize it. Put it in your mind. Seek it. Pray for it. Follow it. Because the mighty hand of God being under it that he may exalt you, and he will. That means, again, the human mind can do very strange thing. Well, exalt, that means he's really gonna make somebody out of me. Uh-uh. Exalt you in gifts. It's still his gift. Get your mind back where it belongs. Well, I want, I want to be exalted. I want to be somebody. Be careful, friend. God does not bless the proud. <laughs> let's take um, let's take the example we've got here. We got Peter. Yeah, Peter was not. Uh, Peter had a good education as far as common sense and commercial fishing go. Peter, no doubt, was had a a fairly good working knowledge of the scriptures. They were taught in that day. When you went to Sunday school. Bear with me, you scholars, bear with me. When you went to Sunday school in that day, you weren't taught little stories like Eve ate an apple, which is not in the Word of God. They were taught 
the scripture. That's what they were taught. So they had a fairly good working knowledge. But he was not a fancy Dan. Any way you want to slice it, he was a fisherman. And I'm sure that when he worked, you know, the, the um, cleaning those old fish, I mean, I'm sure that he was right into it, right up to his elbows. That's why he took all of his upper, outer clothing and when they were working, didn't uh, don't you don't wear your coat while you're fishing and catching and cleaning fish? Why would God pick a man like that? Smells some fishy about him. Smells fishy. Why would God use a man like that to write a book and let him name it after himself? First and Second Peter for all times, fishermen. Why couldn't he have chosen a Harvard graduate? Not that there's anything wrong with a Harvard graduate. I'm going to be spending this next week with one now that I think about it. So I don't want to, don't want to blow my friendship, there, which there's no chance of that. But be that as it may. What I'm saying is God chooses whomever he wishes. Because he knows the heart of the man. <laughs> How would you like to go through what Peter went through denying Christ thrice? Talk about an umbling, get right down on your knees, beg for forgiveness, cry your heart out in tears of, of, of um, disappointment in yourself when he was a man's man. Yeah, that's a um very umbling thing. What I'm saying is I don't care who you are and I don't care what you've done. If God decides to use you, he will use you because it is not you, the person that does it. It is the gift God gives you that you accomplish it with. But he does choose humble people in the heart. Don't ever forget that verse. Verse 7. And it reads, Casting all your care... Care won't get it. Anxieties, all right? You're, are you ever anxious about something? Cast, ca casting all your anxieties upon him, for he careth for you. He loves you. In other words, those things that you're anxious about are usually those things you don't know how you're going to accomplish it. Give it to him. But you do the very best you can at it, and he will see you through. He will guide your hands. He will guide your mind. If you're doing it for him. And, have, you know, and this, this works in people's lives every day, really, that practice it. Because even a worry wart. A worry wart will just get all anxious about everything and just... Really, they'll worry about it for two nights before it comes time to do it, maybe sometimes two weeks or more. And then as they start through it, God help me, it just flows like butter. And after it's over, that was so easy. Well, do you know why? When you ask God to help you and he loves you, he does. And many are not aware Cast all your anxieties upon him. Verse 8, be sober. That means be sensible. Be vigilant. Be um, um, sincere and uh, in using, be aware, be watchful. Have that alarm set we spoke of a lecture or so back. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you, especially if you love God. He's your, he is the adversary. That's one of his names. And as it is written in Job chapter 1, verse 7, he stands right at the altar of God saying, Did you see what your little pretty dude uh, did on earth? You know, did you see that? He's the accuser, and he would like to take you under, all right? 
He can't. You have power over him. Give him a good flogging and send him on his way. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, those same attacks, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Knowing that those attacks do come. That's what you have the gospel armor for, okay? That's why you put it on. Verse 10. But the God of all grace, that's the God of all favor, the God that gives all favors, the God that favors you when you are humble, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. He's called us to share, if you would, in that glory. Do you want to? Called you to work in that glory. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. This word perfect means mature. All right? Makes you, you're never going to be perfect as the word English perfect means. But it does make you mature. Establish, strengthen, and settle you. Settle it in your mind. Where, whereby your maturity will solidify whereby you're not a reed shaken in the wind bouncing from this doctrine to that but you finally grow up and realize that the oracles of God are the is the only doctrine that is profitable profitable in your life because that is the only way that the God the only God of grace that is to say the God of all grace or all favor will favor you whereby in receiving the blessings of God you receive the gift Gifts uh, with God working in and through you, and you even prosper from that on earth. But what is really important is that that was reiterated in verse 4, eternally. Rewarded eternally. Verse 11. To him, to our Father, not to man, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then we have the salutation. Sharpen up for me. But Selvanus, this would be Silas, the same man mentioned by Paul in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. A faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. I've jotted this down, this letter, and he's going to deliver it. Exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God written wherein you stand. If you make a stand, my friend, if you ma to make a stand, you make a difference. If you're just going to hear this beautiful word that Peter has brought forth in this letter and do nothing about it, not grow by it, not to retain any of the wisdom within it, then how are you going to collect on the favor of God? All right? Verse 13, I, I want you to sharpen up again. I want you to note as we read the verse, I'm sorry, you're not going to have it in, on the screen, so I'll have to call it to your attention. Between the word the and at, there is nothing that has been added by man. All right? It has been supplied by the translators whereby it seemingly flows in English, all right? They added the word ecclesia, church. But they should have added the word dispersia, which is to say the children of the dispersal because that's who the letter is addressed to. If in your King James Bible that you check out that information I just gave you, Notice that the church that is is in church that is is in italics, meaning it was added. That's what it means. It was added to the manuscript to make it flow in English, which is legitimate. It's just that they supplied the wrong um, noun because it was addressed. This book it was addressed to those that were scattered, which means dispersed abroad, meaning the tribes of God's elect. All right, now, 
for your information, I don't, I don't like to let something stand that does not add up. Your companion Bibles will document that as well. The church that is at Babylon elected together with you salute you. And so doth Marcus, my son. That would be John Mark, who Peter was very close to. Uh, Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. He was just a small lad, and Peter was very fond of him. But what does it mean, Babylon? There was p many of the peoples that had dispersed at that time were scattered from Babylon up over the Caucasus Mountains, later into Europe, and so forth. Just wanted to, it, that is a very important point. When you go back to the beginning of the book, in other words, you don't, uh, if, if this sounds complicated, let me put it this way. When you write a letter to your, uh, your mom, all right, you don't start off in verse one, dear mom, and write the entire letter and then sign off with, well, grandma. Let's see you later, grandma. No, you sign it off, Mom. You sign it off the same to the same person you wrote it to and addressed in the beginning. All right? And it was to the strangers. The, you notice in chapter 1, verse 1, it was written to the strangers scattered throughout uh, those various places, which included Babylon. All right? And that area. Okay, verse 14 to complete the book. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. He wished his peace upon those that were not mentioned Christ's names, but were in Jesus Christ, meaning they were in him and he was in them, and naturally he would wish peace upon them. Took a little longer to do that chapter than I anticipated it was, so the, the, the uh, recap will be rather brief. What does Peter mean? It means Epathra is rock. It was a rock that God chose in which he would establish his church. We notice then, coming from chapter 1 into chapter 2, that the whole theory was based on the rock, all right, but the rock is the chief cornerstone. That is the cap rock. It is as though you would put the, the cap rock is missing off the pyramid. Why? Christ is not here. Let's put it in that way. There are some through the Illuminati and others that give a different uh, connotation to this, but that is the chief cornerstone. It will be placed back. Uh, literally, no. For as far as the church and the many-membered body, yes. And that cap rock comes from the Old Testament. Uh, you found that in chapter 2, verses 6 through 9 children of the promise, the promise of the cap rock, the headstone, that it also would become a stumbling block and would fall on and crush certain others. Why? You don't pay attention to what he teaches through his chosen called ones. Peter being the example here. And he continued on then establishing that and telling us how to get along in our families by submitting everyone to the other. Do you know what that means? That means get along. Don't be anxious. Don't cry over spilt milk, he said. Don't be someone that just flies to pieces at the first little thing that goes wrong because that is a mark of an unstable individual and not too Christian. Christians should be a very stable people, shouldn't, in other words, I could use the old saying, don't ever let them see you sweat, honey, because we don't have to. I don't care what you run up against, you're going through it because it's God's promise to you. And then what a beautiful chapter. He tells us in the fourth chapter exactly what we're supposed to teach. The scriptures of God not quarterlies, not men's traditions, but the scriptures of the living God. Why should you teach the scriptures of the living God only? Being sensible about it, using just plain common sense. If you are a Christian, it should be obvious to you that God is he who blesses. 
And if you don't do it his way, he's not going to bless you. So it's idiocy to teach anything else. A waste of time to not love him enough that you can take his letter that he has written to you and open it, relish it, love it. The wisdom and the information and the counsel that he has for you to be successful. It makes common sense, especially, beloved, when there's no other way to be successful for an eternity. Want it? Then take it. All right? All right. Bless your hearts. We'll conclude there with the book of 1 Peter. We'll begin 2 Peter in the next lecture. All right. Bless your hearts.